soldiers. It is time to take the Owl Kingdoms. Those birds are doing something terribly wrong. And you're gonna need to fly a long way to get to the Guardians. You mean they're real? Oh, they're real, all right. What are we gonna do, Soren? We're gonna find the Guardians of Garhul. You've all come this far, each protecting the other. When you have flown as far as you can, you're halfway there! What did he say? We're halfway there! Legend of the Guardians, The Owls of Gahul is the new animated film directed by the guy who did 300 and Watchmen, Zack Snyder, about two owl brothers who were taken far from home. One of them ends up escaping the clutches of the villains, and he flies off with his new friends to get help from these mythical owls who may or may not exist. The storyline isn't great. The animation, however, is some of the best I've seen. It's it's really well done. The animators must have spent a lot of time perfecting every single part of the movie. Even if the story doesn't interest you, it's worth seeing just for the visuals. It almost looks real. There were a lot of, like, young kids going to see this film with the dads, and I was surprised at how dark the film is at times. It has that Zack Snyder-esque feel to it. It's got the slow motion fight scenes, which we've seen in both 300 and Watchmen, which is probably going to be his trademark. And obviously, if there's fight sequences, there will be violence. I'm not really into all this CGI, just when it's two CGI characters fighting, it doesn't really in like interest me or excite me, but because it's two owls fighting, it's fairly impressive and very fluent because the fighting, especially at the end, is pretty much all in slow motion. It's clear as to who's fighting who. The voice casting for the film was also very good. In the trailer, you'll have recognised the voice of Hugo Weaving, who has that real recognisable tone in his voice. He played the father of the two brother owls, but I think he, he voiced another character further into the film. I'm, I'm sure I heard his voice twice. Um, also, David Wenham, who was Faramir in Lord of the Rings, he was in the film. Also, Helen Mirren as the... I think she voiced the small cute owl, but I'm not sure. And Sam Neill from Jurassic Park and Geoffrey Rush from Pirates of the Caribbean. Also, the music was really something special. It, it had this native style to it, and when the main owl is flying through the fire at the end, I swear I've heard that from 300 or Gladiator or Avatar, something like that. Overall, though, it's a, it's a decent animated film. It's much more serious than what I would have liked. There were funny characters, but overall it's a very serious and at times dark film. It's basically a medieval fantasy Dungeons and Dragons style film disguised as a kids movie. The, the only thing which kind of pissed me off about this film was the word gizzard. I mean seriously, I should have counted how many times the characters said the word gizzard, it was ridiculous. I never thought I'd get sick of hearing gizzard but anyways it is a decent adventure film with great visuals Everything's brilliantly rendered. The 3D was good, but at times blurry. The storyline, like I said, wasn't anything special, but it's still overall a good film. And <clears throat> one more thing. This film had another battle cry. You might have heard Return of the King or Braveheart, but Legend of the Guardians has another one. Sharpen the Battle Claws! Come on, Soren. We're not finished yet, boy. To be a young owl with a taste for adventure, arriving at the tree for the first time. Legend of the Guardians. The Owls of... Edinburgh, 1828. The greatest minds came from all over the world. And so did these guys. We've got no money to speak of. No plan. We just have to work out what the demand is for, and then supply it. But in every cloud, there's a silver lining. We're flat out broke. What about old Donald's rent money? <laughs> He's 
dead. Get rid of the body before it starts to stink up the place more than you two. We used to sell to Dr. Knox at three pounds a cadaver. Three pounds. And I thought life around here was supposed to be cheap. This is wrong. I am confident that this is the only way. I had confidence in a fart once, and I shot all over myself. Now, Birkin Hare, I was really looking forward to. I love John Landis's other work, and I love American Wealth in London, so I was like, this could be a very good film. The main storyline is about two Irish immigrants, Simon Pegg and Andy Serkis, who start their own business, I guess, selling dead bodies of people to surgeons, because at the time in the 19th century, these surgeons had shows where they would cut people open and dissect them in front of a crowd. They get their bodies, or try to get them, by grave robbing basically just being opportunistic or by actually killing the people themselves this is what I paid to see but that really wasn't what I got the film strayed off in a different direction too much time went into the romance between Simon Pegg and Isla Fisher who's hot as shit but I just didn't care for her and the play which she was trying to make also the film seemed to have a pattern it was like Simon and Andy trying to kill someone, Simon Pegg sat watching the play, Simon and Andy trying to rob a grave, Andy Serkis having sex with Jessica Hines, it, it just became fairly predictable as to what the next scene would be about. The casting for the film was pretty good, Andy Serkis looked the part, Simon Pegg's Irish accent was a little off, but it'll do. Also there were a decent number of cameo appearances, Christopher Lee got to love Christopher Lee. He played a very small part in the film as one of the victims of Burke and Hare. Stephen Merchant was also in there at the end, but no one no one cares about him though. Ronnie Corbett, who doesn't love Ronnie Corbett? I, I wouldn't say his was a cameo appearance, more of a supporting role. Um, but also it was nice to see Jenny Agatha and David Shawfield, both of which were in John Landis's American Wealth in London, so it was nice to see them together again. But, you know, overall, Burke and Hare was okay. It wasn't bad to the point where I wouldn't want to watch it again, but I wouldn't see it in theatres. Maybe pick it up on DVD in, in, I don't know, a couple of months when it's cheap, or maybe rent it from Blockbuster or something, but it was okay. It could have been so much better if the writers just made the main focus of the film on Burke and Hare and them basically trying to kill people in funny ways. I would have liked it much more. The funniest parts in the film can actually be seen in the trailer, but you know what, I'm glad that John Landis is back because it's been, what, eight years? So hopefully he'll carry on making films and I'll look forward to whatever he does in the future. And this is the Edinburgh Militia. Oh, for the love of Lord Jesus! I beg your pardon. Bird and Hare. Skyline follows in the spirit of the sci-fi movies like Independence Day and War of the Worlds, but has that straight to DVD feel to it. In other words, it sucks. The first time I ever heard about the film was after seeing the poster. The poster looked amazing. Then I watched the first trailer. That also made it look good. And then the second trailer came out, which showed much more of the film, and after that I wasn't as excited to see it. The budget was approximately 10 million, which is very small for this type of film, 
but all of the money went into the special effects because no time went into developing the characters, actually producing a decent script and at least trying to get some known actors. The film is quite impressive with the CGI, at least for the most part. The alien ships and the giant creatures look pretty good, but it's the little details such as clouds of smoke and explosions which actually look quite terrible. They just look too fake if you know what I mean. As for the characters, they were terrible. The only one I was rooting for was David Zayas, David Zayas's character, I don't know, the one who was on Dexter. His character was fairly badass, at least compared to the others. The monsters were pretty cool, I'll have to admit, and the fight scenes were where the aeroplanes are fighting the alien spaceships, they were actually really exciting, they were really good. Also the alien tentacles, yeah, the alien tentacle spaceship mini robotic shit, I don't know, which enter the building and suck the people up, uh, no homo, um, have a very similar shaped head to the aliens in Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds, and they also seem to recreate that scene where the tentacles are searching through the room and the people are hiding hoping not to get caught. But the thing which topped it off for me was the ending. I mean, come on. It's it's like the writers just thought up the shittest way to end the film, hinting at a possible sequel. I'm not even going to explain how fucking atrocious the ending was. But after watching the film, I came home Eventually, you know, later in the afternoon, I went on IMDb and looked up the directors. The only other film they have directed was Alien vs. Predator Requiem. Alien vs. Predator Requiem. If I had known that before, I probably wouldn't have even gone to see this, but... Overall, bad film. Not worthy of an actual theatre release. If I'd watched it on the sci-fi channel I would have actually enjoyed it because I know I'm not paying to see it don't listen to other people because you know I've heard people I know people in college who went to see this they actually liked it I, I just thought it was crap but the fact that it got hyped up so much that we were thinking it would be the next District 9 or Cloverfield god were we wrong